You know, I look back at this phase of my life at some incredible opportunities I've had to preach God's Word in more than 100 countries and uh, look back to some really exciting times like preaching in the Olympic Stadium in Amsterdam with 25,000 people there and in the largest church in the world in Seoul, Korea with 75,000 in one service. By the way, they have sev seven Sunday services with 7, 75,000 in each service. Is that incredible? But I'll tell you what, those are not the most exciting times I have had sharing God's Word. Because the most exciting, sincerely, times have been sharing God's Word with someone one-to-one -one when I know that I'm on a divine appointment that God has opened the door for in someone's life where their eternal destiny hangs on a decision that they're going to make about Jesus Christ. How many of you want to be ready for those times when God has them in your life? Let me see your hand. We're going to look at the greatest example I believe there is of how to deal with, a, converse with a person one-to-one -one. in John's Gospel, chapter 4. If you want to turn with me, the scripture will be on the screen. But uh, in John chapter 3 and 4, we have two accounts. John chapter 3. How many know John 3, 16? Do you know that the best known verse of Scripture in the Bible was not proclaimed in the Sermon on the Mount or by a seaside to a crowd of people, but it was spoken softly in the night to the probing questions of a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews, who came to Jesus. And those words he spoke to that one person are the best known verse in the Bible. Did you ever think about that? And then in the next chapter, in chapter four, we have an encounter of Jesus with the Samaritan woman at the well. There probably couldn't be two people more different than Nicodemus, this ruler of the Jews, and the Samaritan woman who had been married five times and now she's living with a guy that's not her husband. And yet Jesus devoted himself to these individuals. If you read both of those, I encourage you when you go home to read John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. And just look at how Jesus very individually and personally dealt with those two people. We're going to focus as just a springboard in John chapter 4. And I'll give you a little summary. Jesus is going through Samaria because he's on his way from one place to another, and Samaria was in the middle. And, uh, you know, we're on our way every day somewhere. And, you know, it's while we're on our way doing normal things that God opens doors of opportunity for us to interact with people. So he sits down by the well because he's tired. Now notice this, even though he's the son of God, when he was in the flesh, Jesus was not omniscient, he was not omnipresent, and he was not omnipotent. He had, as we read in Philippians, emptied himself of those divine attributes, not of his divine character. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And here's what's encouraging to us. Do you know that when Jesus went into his public ministry first, he, he went out into the wilderness, led of the Spirit, full of the Spirit, was tested in the wilderness, came back, and then stood up to the synagogue and read the Scripture, full of the Holy Spirit, and the first words to come out of his mouth were, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Do you know that Jesus did what he did in the power of the same Holy Spirit that he promised to us? That just as the Holy Spirit empowered Jesus, the Holy Spirit is here to empower us to be his witnesses. So he sits down by the well because he's tired it simply says it in Scripture. Being weary from his journey, he sat by the well, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now, it was in the heat of the noonday sun, which is not when the rest of the women drew the water, but because of her social status in the community, she came later when the others were gone. And Jesus asked her for a drink. And she said, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me, for a drink because I'm a Samaritan woman. And then John explains in the text why she said that. He said, for Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. And you see, she was just floored by the fact. 
And he starts to talk about water and then leads it to living water. And then you know when he finally talks about, he, she, he says, go call your husband. And she said, I have no husband. And he said, you're right. And then the Holy Spirit revealed this to Jesus, that you, uh, you're right because you have no husband. You have had five husbands, and the one you're living with now is not your husband. And she responds, sir, I see, perceive that you're a prophet And then she brings up the issue of religion. Our fathers say that this mountain's the place to worship, and the Jews say Jerusalem is the place to worship. Now here she brings up a religious question. I'm gonna stop and ask you a question. Let's just be honest, family, church family. How many of you, one of the things that intimidates you about talking to non-believers is that you're afraid they're gonna bring up a religious question and you don't know the answer? Let me see your hands because I'm gonna help you this morning, big time, okay? I'm gonna give you the Randy Hurst three-step process to dealing with difficult religious questions. Step one, compliment them on their intelligence. Wow, Bob, that's a great question. Hello? Second, be honest. I gotta be honest, Bob, I don't know the answer to that question. Step three, pass the buck. But you know what, Bob? If you'll come with me to First Assembly on Sunday on Summerlin Road and Colonial, there's a guy there named Dr. Joe Mulvihill. He's one of the smartest men I know, and we'll ask him after service, and he'll explain that to you. Don't you love it? You turned what could have been a difficult problem into an invitation to church. And that's part of his portfolio, be the answer man at First Assembly. Seriously, don't let yourself and witness get sidetracked on religion. The issue is not religion. The issue is relationship. And he comes to the point, she says, says, I know that when Messiah comes, he will tell everything to us. And Jesus then says, I who speak to you am he. He revealed himself to her. May I tell you, folks, the focus of our, and the purpose and the objective of our witness is always to bring people to Jesus. They have to make a decision about Jesus. Then she runs into town, says, come see a man who told me everything I ever did, and many others in the village believe because of the woman. Then the disciples return, and we come to what was one of the very common missionary texts I heard as a kid growing up in Assemblies of God churches. John chapter four, verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for harvest. Now, I will tell you, when I was a kid growing up, I heard so many missionaries quote that verse, and they'd say, look at the harvest is ripe in Africa, or the harvest is ripe in China, the harvest is ripe in Latin America. All of those things are true. But the primary application of what Jesus was saying was not about somewhere else. It was right where you are. He was saying, gentlemen, you walked right by a white harvest field and did not even notice her. Because then he goes on and says, already he who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Here I want to just mention something. My mind goes to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Do you remember when people in the church at Corinth, some of them were saying that they felt closer to the Apostle Paul. Others felt closer to Apollos. And, and, and in 1 Corinthians 3, Paul writes to them, when you say one of you, I am of Paul or I am of Apollos. You see, Paul was the first founding pastor of the church and Apollos was the pastor who followed him. Some of the people had come to the Lord under Apollos' ministry. Some had come under Paul's ministry. Now, we all have a special place in our heart for the person that God used as the messenger when we received Christ, amen? How many of you can think of a person 
when you received Christ who witnessed to you one-to-one -one, or a preacher who preached when you made the decision to follow Christ? Let me see your hand. How many, is that person special to you? Of course they are. And that's not a bad thing, but what he says is, when you think that way, that is being human. That's a human thing. He said, what is Paul? What is Apollos? We are just servants through you who, whom you believed as the Lord gave opportunity to each one. I planted. Now, what did he plant? He planted the word, the gospel, when he first came to Corinth. Then he leaves and goes to Ephesus. And he says, and then Apollos followed me, and he watered the message that I had planted. But then when he changes to God's activity, he changes tense in Greek. This is very important. To from not from one point in time. What he's saying is, for a brief period of time, I planted the word in your life. For another brief period of time, Apollos has watered the word. But when he changes to what God does, he changes to a linear tense. That means all along, even before I planted the message, while I was planting, while Apollos was watering, and beyond Apollos' work, all along, God was causing the growth. How many of you know that before you ever heard the message, God, through circumstances often in your life and in other things, prepared your heart for the message? How many of you know that? Here's what I want you to understand. Do you know that God is doing that in lives of people all around you so that when you take the message of Jesus, God's already been working before you. Hello. If that doesn't excite you, your exciter's busted. God doesn't just ask us to go work for him. He asks us to work with him. I want to share with you then this last part of this verse where he says this. In this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that which you, for you, which you have have not labored. Listen to this. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. May I tell you, in the lives of people, and I'm going to share a few testimonies from my own life this morning as time permits. Do you know that in almost every case, in fact, in every case, when I share the message, God had already been working in their life, and in many cases, someone else had already been working in their life. Isn't that incredible? So he asks us to join the team. How many want to join the team? And all he asks us to do is our part. We're not responsible to produce the results. May I tell you, you and I are not responsible to convince one non-believer to become a Christian. That's not our job. That's the Holy Spirit's job. How many are relieved? Hello? Let that take a big burden off you? Let's dive in. I want to share with you four lessons from Jesus uh, dealing with a woman at the well. And the first one's very simple. Seize natural opportunities. He was going from Judea into Galilee, and he was there, wanted to drink, sat by a well. It was a natural opportunity. A number of years ago, it was before we had e-tickets, you know, electronic tickets for the airlines. I had to go get a paper ticket at a travel agent. Every Friday, I'd go by Sunshine Travel on Sunshine in Springfield, Missouri, and pick up my ticket to fly out the next day to preach somewhere all over the country. So this would be about 50 times a year, right? Well, Sunshine Travel assigned me a personal travel agent named Vicki. Now, let me share something with you. When you have regular interactions with people in business, in stores, in gas stations, in restaurants, whatever, take just a couple of minutes to get to know that person. And so I would just not just grab my ticket and run. I'd say, Vicki, tell me a little about yourself. Just take two or three minutes or four or five minutes. And I got to know her bit by bit. Two months later, after I started getting my tickets there, I came in and I, I looked at Vicki's face. She didn't hardly looked up at me because she looked very sad. And you know what? A sad face can be a tip off that it's an opportunity for ministry. I said, Vicki, something's wrong. I can tell by your face. I said, I don't know what your problem is, but I said, God's got a solution to your problem. I said, would you like to talk about it? And she looked around and said, yeah, but not here. 
can we go somewhere else? Can we go around the corner of Steak and Shake? And I said, okay. So we went right around the corner of Steak and Shake. And I want to tell you, within half an hour, before we finished our cheeseburgers, I had the privilege of reaching across the table, taking Vicki's hand, leading her in a prayer to receive Jesus into her heart. A few weeks later, at home in her house, she was in a room sitting cross-legged on the floor just praying God filled her with the Holy Spirit. She quit her job, enrolled in Evangel College, got a bachelor's degree in biblical studies, went on to the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary, got a three-year Master of Divinity degree, and now she's serving the Lord. May I tell you, friends, just take a little time God will open the door if you will just get to know people. So seize natural opportunities. Number two, find a focus of interest. Here's an idea. If you're going to converse with people, (laughs) it helps to be interesting. It doesn't help to be boring. How many want to know the difference? Talking about you is boring. Talking about them is interesting. You don't believe in next time you're at a party and introduced to somebody? Don't say, oh, Shirley, it's so nice to meet you. Wrong. Say, Shirley, I've heard so much about you. Walk away. She'll follow you around trying to find out what you heard. Hello, people. People are interested in themselves. Let me give you an example. I got on a, on a flight between uh, Washington, D.C. and Dallas. Uh, by good luck that time, I was upgraded. I hardly ever get upgraded anymore. Back in those days, if you were gold or platinum, you got upgraded a lot. So I'm in first class. And a guy gets on the plane. I immediately recognized his face. And I had seen him for years on page five of the airline magazine. He's the president, and, or was at the time, the president and CEO of one of the two largest airlines in the world. Guess where he had his seat assigned? Right next to the preacher. Hello? Now, how are you going to get the interest of the president of this airline? I introduced myself. Hi, my name is Randy. I know who you are. And he said, well, do you fly with us often, Randy? Now, I know this was cheesy, okay? But I had my gold card that I'd had for boarding early, and I handed it to him. It said one million miles. By the way, now it's three million miles. But then it was one million miles. And he said, boy, you do fly often with us, don't you? I said, yes. I've also flown a million miles, and I named his primary competition. I said, I've also flown a million miles on. I said, would you be interested? Would you be interested in knowing what they do better than you do? (laughs) How many think I got attention? All right. And he said, yes, I would very much. I started to tell him ideas. He took out a notepad. He started taking notes. After he took a bunch of notes, he said, Randy, You got blankety blank. He used profanity, so I can't quote him, okay? He said, you got blankety blank good ideas. He said, they're now going to be part of my system. Oh, don't mess with middlemen, people. Go to the top. (laughs) By the way, the next Saturday, when I checked in to fly out on that airline, the manager of the station in Springfield, Missouri said, hey, did you fly with? And he named the president of the airline. I said, yes, I did. He said, we got a memo. We're supposed to do all kinds of certain stuff for you. (laughs) Hey, there are benefits, fringe benefits to witnessing, folks. Hello. So anyway, he said, you got blankly blank good ideas. I said, well, I hope they were helpful. But I said, you know, I know what you do for a living, but you don't know what I do for a living. That's right, Randy. What do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher. And he just remembered that he told me how many blankety blank good ideas I had. Hello. And I said, he said, well, what can I do for you? I said, look, I said, when we first sat down, not long after that, the flight attendant came back and she came to you first and said, the meal choices this afternoon are a chef's salad 
or a chicken sandwich? Which do you prefer? What do you think the president preferred? I don't know. He said, well, why? he gestured toward me. He said, why don't you see what our paying guests would like, and I'll take whatever's left over. Hello? I said, you know, when you said that, why did you have her give me my choice first? He said immediately, because I can't expect our, our uh, staff to pe treat our customers any better than I set the example. Hello? I said, I kind of think thought that's what it was. I said, here's my favor I want to ask you. I just want your permission. He said, permission for what? I said, I want to use you as an illustration in a sermon that I preach. Would you like to know what the sermon's about? <laughs> he said, yeah, what course he does. Now he's in the sermon. Hello? <laughs> I said, the sermon is on servant leadership. And I said, Jesus Christ, the greatest leader in all of history, said he didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And because he had given me my choice of meal, it opened the door to share how Jesus gave his life for all of us. Do you see what I'm saying, folks? It's not about a prepackaged routine. It's about the Lord guiding your conversation in things that they are interested in, in things that they can relate to, and God will open doors and give you opportunity if you find a focus of interest to them. Number three, center on Jesus. I already told you, it's not about religion, folks. It's about relationship. You know, recently I read again something that C.S. Lewis, I'm sure many of you, most of you probably know who he was. He made an incredible statement about Jesus' claims to who he was. He said, if Jesus, what Jesus said about himself is true, he said, nothing is more important. If what Jesus said about himself is not true, it is totally unimportant. What Jesus said about himself cannot possibly be is moderately important. Are you with me? You see, folks, every person, you can't have it and say, oh, yeah, Jesus was a great philosopher. He was a great teacher. He was a great humanitarian. No, you can't have it that way. Jesus clearly revealed who he was, the Son of God. He either was and is God the Son or he wasn't. And that is what every person has to make a decision. There are many wonderful tools and methods of personal evangelism. Dr. Bill Bright came up with the four spiritual laws. How many of you ever heard of that? That's wonderful, and it's been used to help many, many people. How many heard of the Romans Road? Romans 3.23, Romans 6.23, Romans 10, 9, and 10. That has helped a lot of people. All of those things are good. But may I tell you, over the years, I've come to see it as a simpler and simpler issue. And I really got this. It's not original. I got this from reading the, the evangelistic proclamations of one man, the Apostle Peter. In fact, in the book of Acts, and you can remember these numbers easily, and they'll put them up on the screen for you. In Acts chapter 2, 3, 4, 5, and 10. What do those numbers have in common? In every one of those chapters, you will find an account of the Apostle Peter proclaiming Jesus. And in every one of them, he doesn't use the same words in any of them, but in every one of them, he addresses two issues, Jesus' identity and the purpose of his mission on earth. He answers essentially two questions. Who is Jesus and why did he give his life? How many know who Jesus is? How many know why he gave his life? May I tell you, you are ready to share the gospel with anyone. It's that simple. If Jesus was not the Son of God, then why he gave his life is beside the point. But because he was and is God and lived a sinless life,
and sacrificed his life, gave his life. Death could not hold him. That's why after three days, and we're gonna celebrate this in a couple of weeks, he came out of hell, led captivity captive. When he appeared to John the Beloved in Revelation, he said, I hold the keys of hell and the grave. He has conquered death and the grave. Why did he give his life? Two reasons. Because I'm a sinner. And there was nothing I could do about it. I know the most uncomfortable thing in evangelism to talk about is sin. <clears throat> Jesus brought up the issue of the woman's husband's because it addressed an issue in her life, sin and forgiveness. May I tell you, there is no salvation without forgiveness. There is no forgiveness without confession. There is no confession without conviction. There is no conviction without a clear message of sin and forgiveness. You say, well then do I need to memorize Romans 3, 23, 6, 23, 10, 9, and 10? Yes, that's great. But what do you do if they never grew up in Sunday school, if they don't believe the Bible is the word of God? Many of the people that I witness to don't believe the Bible. So what do I say? And I talk, first of all, I will tell you this. I don't talk to them about their sin. I talk to them about my sin. I say, let me tell you, Bob or whoever it is, why I know I'm a sinner and needed God's forgiveness. You see, folks, whether someone believes the Bible or not, God has put something in every human being who is not mentally challenged or insane, a conscience. Do you know that little kids have a conscience? We all know what we don't want other people to do to us, right? And when we do to somebody else what we don't want them to do to us, our conscience tells us that's wrong. May I tell you, in all the times I've witnessed on airplanes, I only once had one man who believed he'd never sinned. He had a PhD from Harvard University. He had educated himself beyond the concept of sin. One person. It's sin and forgiveness. Why did he give his life? Because we're sinners and there's nothing that we could do about it. That's the centrality, the message of Jesus. And the fourth lesson from Jesus with a woman at the well is you're not alone. Notice what he said again. He who sows and he who reaps will rejoice together Others have labored or worked. You have entered into their work. God asks us to enter into God's work. May I tell you that I believe the primary reason, and by the way, let me give you, give you a statistic. <clears throat> they have done research for many years of four kinds of churches. Fundamentalist churches, evangelical churches, Pentecostal churches, and charismatic churches. All four of them statistically are almost identical. They have discovered that the vast majority of personal evangelism is done by less than 10% of the congregation. Almost all the evangelism. How many believe that? Here's the second statistic. Of those 10%, not all of them, but the vast majority have been Christians less than one year. How many of you believe that? You know why? When someone's new to Jesus, they're like Peter and John were in Acts chapter 4, I believe it was. We cannot but speak of the things we've seen and heard. But after a while, they evolve out of the passion for witnessing. But we have to, I believe, the primary reason most people are inhibited about witnessing is they don't understand the difference between their job and God's job. Okay, I'm gonna share you a little secret I didn't in the first service, okay? God will do everything for you that you can't do for yourself. But he will not do for you what you can. Let me illustrate it for you. I have personally seen incredible divine healing situations. I have seen the lame walk, I have seen the blind see, I have seen someone 
with severe curvature of the spine within about 30 seconds totally straighten up and their bones were cracking as they did it and they started running up and down the aisle in the church. I have never seen anyone under God's miraculous power instantaneously lose weight. <laughs> do you know why? God will do for you what you can't do for yourself, but he won't do for you what you can. If there's something we can do about it, hello? Now here's what we need to understand about evangelism. We have to understand the difference between our part in evangelism and God's part in evangelism. He expects us to sow and water the seed, to share the message, but we aren't responsible to bring anyone to a decision. That's the Holy Spirit's job. In Acts chapter 16, I believe, when Paul went down with his companions down by the river at Philippi, he ran into a woman named Lydia, a seller of purple cloth from Thyatira. And Luke records that Lydia responded to Paul's message. But he says something beautiful. Now I will tell you, every preacher prays and hopes that people will respond to their message. But we all know something. Luke said this. He didn't just say Lydia responded to Paul's message. He said the Lord opened Lydia's heart to respond to Paul's message. You see, I can preach, Pastor Russ can preach, Pastor Bester, Betzer can preach, not one of us is capable of opening a heart. Billy Graham could not open a, are you with me? How many of you know only God could open your heart? And only God can open the heart of the person you're witnessing to. So take the pressure off yourself. It's not your job to open a heart or to convince someone to make a decision. It is your job to share the message. Let me quickly share a couple of illustrations with you, okay? I'll take them both from airplanes. I got on a flight from Greensboro to Chicago. Now, by the way, even if you got... In my case with American Airlines, I've got platinum for life. It doesn't mount to much anymore. But they don't line up the people at the gate and say, Mr. Hurst, since you're a platinum customer, who would you like to ride with? You don't get to choose your neighbor. How many figured that out when you bought your house? Did you notice the realtor didn't introduce you to the neighbor? May I tell you, the neighbor comes with the house. Hello? I'm fortunate because on every side in Springfield, Missouri, I've got wonderful neighbors. Who is your neighbor? You know, Jesus answered that question with a story. The man said to him when, when Jesus was talking about the greatest commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, then the man said, who is my neighbor? And Jesus gave a story. How many know the story? The Good Samaritan. Now, it's obvious in the story that the guy in the ditch is a Jew. Am I right? The priest that goes by is a Jew. The Levite that goes by is a Jew. The two guys that went by <clears throat> were his kind of people. The Samaritan was not his kind of people. Now by Jesus telling the story, I'm gonna speculate so I'll get out of the pulpit here. What he was really doing was saying to this man, you don't really wanna know who your neighbor is. You want to know who is not your neighbor. What you really want to know is who you don't have to have compassion on. Are you with me? That's what he wanted. Who is my neighbor? I want an excuse of who I don't have to do this for. But what Jesus was also saying is this. You're asking the wrong question. The issue is not who is your neighbor. The issue is what kind of neighbor are you? Do you think the Samaritan helped the guy in the ditch because he was a Jew? No. He helped the guy in the ditch because he was there. Our neighbor is just there. It's not who they are. It's not their ethnicity. It's not their education. It's not their wealth status. He'd fallen among thieves and was half dead. 
And a Samaritan had compassion on him. You see, people, for me, and yes, Vicky was my neighbor on a regular basis at the travel agency, but most of my life where I've had time with people is on airplanes. And my neighbors are strapped in next to me. And here, coming on board, was a guy, six foot five, Stetson Hulk cowboy hat, handlebar mustache, ostrich skin cowboy boots, belt buckle looked like he'd won a World Wrestling Federation title. And he sits next to me. And I said, hi, my name's Randy, what's your name? He said, my name's HR. Now what do I know? He's from the South. How do I know he's from the South? They don't give them names in the South. They give them letters. HR, BJ, TL. Are you with me? Oh, they give some of them names, but they always give them two names, like Billy Bob or Wilma Jean. Now, normally, I start a conversation by saying, what do you do for a living? Before I could even ask, he said, tell me something, Randy, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a preacher, HR. Now, when you tell someone on an airplane you're a preacher, one of two things is going to happen. They're going to look for another seat, or you'll know they're going to be willing to listen to you. Guess what he said? Well, that's wonderful, Randy, that you're a preacher. Tell me something since you're a preacher. Do you pray before you get on the airplane that it's not going to crash? And I said, HR, I got to tell you honestly, I don't, and I'll tell you why, I don't worry about that kind of thing because my life belongs to my Lord Jesus and I don't worry about whether a plane's going to crash. I said, but you know what I very often do pray? He said, what? I said, I pray that God will sit me next to someone that needs to sit next to a preacher. <laughs> Are you with me? And he didn't move. I said, tell me something. What do you do for a living, HR? He said, I'm a furniture manufacturer. I said, boy, you don't look like a furniture manufacturer. You look like a rodeo cowboy or something. Now remember, talk about them. Ask about them. And I said, tell me something, HR. Surely you didn't start out life wanting to be a furniture manufacturer. Oh, of course not. I said, what did you really want to be? He said, I just wanted to be an optometrist. I said, you look less like an optometrist than you do a furniture manufacturer. Now let me tell you something, one of the most powerful questions you can ask in a conversation of anybody, why? I said, HR, why did you want to be an optometrist? He said, I always thought one of the most wonderful things you could do for anybody would be to give them the gift of sight. I said, HR, you just told me a lot about yourself. Life's more important to you than making money, isn't it? He said, yeah, it is. I said, you want to help people? He said, yeah, I do. I said, do you know that before you were born, God had a plan for your life? I don't know if it was to be an optometrist. I do know he wanted to use you to help other people. I said, I don't think it's happening. But I said, you know, HR, it can't happen. God's plan for your life unless you're in right relationship with your creator. And that only comes through his son, Jesus Christ. And I explained why. And then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. It was just a very simple question. I said, HR, what happened to you three weeks ago? He said, what? I said, three weeks ago, Something happened to you that prepared you to sit next to a preacher on an airplane. What was it? He said, I was taking a load of furniture to a furniture show in Fargo, North Dakota, in a semi-truck. Got caught in a snowstorm, was snowed in in Aberdeen, South Dakota. He said, I parked my rig, checked into a motel. Walked down the street, two blocks down the street, was a topless bar. I used to go to topless bars a lot. And he said, I walked into it that night and something strange happened. He said, I felt dirty inside. And I turned around and walked out of the bar 
And I walked back to the motel. I went in my room, sat down on my bed, and turned on the TV. And who do you think was on television? Billy Graham. I said, what did Billy do? Preach the sermon. Then what did he do? Invited people to receive Christ. What did you do? Turn the TV off. Why? He said, I really wanted to. But I didn't think I understood how. He said, I got down and knelt by my bed. And I said, God, if you want my life, you can have it. But you've got to send somebody to tell me how to give it to you. People, you think it's difficult to witness when God has people prepared like that? I close with one story on a flight from London to Dallas. After a while, the flight attendant seat was empty next to me. She sat down. We got in a conversation. I invited her to sit down. We got talking. And I don't want to say this happens every time because it doesn't, but it happens at both of these cases of HR and this lady. The Holy Spirit showed me something. Now, I will tell you something. When the Holy Spirit shows me something about somebody, I don't go telling them that. You don't freak people out, okay? I just use that information to guide me. But in this case, I thought I ought to tell her. And I said, you know, when you gave me the shrimp when we first got on the flight, I said, God spoke to me. And he told me something about you. I said, you just got divorced, didn't you? And her face changed like a light switch. And she nodded her head, yes. And I said, you need God's help in your life. I said, and I explained to her the essence of the gospel. I said to her, would you get into trouble if I prayed with you here to receive Jesus into your heart? She said, I don't care if I get fired. She said, because I have something to tell you. I don't fly this route. She said, I was taking some days off after the divorce, was home in my apartment, depressed, all the bad memories. And she said, the phone rang. It was my supervisor from DFW. And she said, someone just called in sick. We're one flight attendant short on the London flight. You live close to the airport. Can you rush over here and get on this flight so we can get it out on time? She said, I threw my clothes in a bag. And she said, on the way out the door, I stopped. And for the first time in many years, I prayed. I said, God, my life is a mess. Please show me on this trip how I can put it back together again. Do you know people... There are lost people who are praying to God for help, waiting for someone to tell them. Wednesday night, Dr. Kreps shared his challenge at the end. He was talking about being a normal New Crust Testament Christian. And you know what he said? You don't have to do something fantastic today. Just do something for Jesus, however little it is, and he'll be pleased. Just do something for Jesus, and he'll be happy. I want to share three things quickly that everybody can do. Everybody can do. First of all, share your story. How many remember what your life was like before you met Jesus? How many know the difference he made in your life? you got a story to tell anyone who doesn't know him. Number two, pray with people. Do you know that when you pray with someone, now let me give you a little counsel. Don't storm heaven and Burger King and embarrass the person and 
draw attention to yourself. You can do it quietly. If it's not a place where you can pray with them, say you'll pray for them. But if you can at all possible, let me tell you why. When you pray for a person, if you listen, most of effective witnessing can be listening. And if they've expressed a problem, say, you know, I serve a God who answers prayer. He's answered so many of my prayers. Would it be okay right now if I just prayed for you right now? And you know, when you pray in the presence of a person, they can tell by not what you say, how you say it, that you have a relationship with the God that you serve. That is a witness. And lastly, invite them to church. There's not a better time of the year than Easter and Christmas. These little pink cards about King Jesus for the Easter week. Pick some up on the way out, two or three or five. Put them in your purse, put them in your wallet. And I'm gonna pray with you for a moment, in a moment as pastor comes. I'm gonna pray with you for God to open doors for at the very least in this way, you invite at least one person in the next two weeks to come to Easter services. Let me put you on the spot. How many are willing to do that? Lord Jesus, you see these hands. As pastor comes, I just pray. Not just that people give out cards in the next couple of weeks, that they'll pray with people, that they'll share their testimony. I pray most of all this morning that you will have affirmed the truth of your word, that you don't ask us to do anything we can't do. Just sow and water the seed. Only you can open hearts. And if we'll do what we can, God, you'll do what we can't. Do you believe in your heart that God's gonna help you do this? Would you just express your faith and praise before a pastor comes? Thank God for what he's going to do in and through your life. Lift your hands and praise him. Lord, we just thank you. We praise you, Jesus, for the opportunities that you give us. In Jesus' name. Hey there, family. I'm Pastor Carrie right here at First Assembly. Thank you so much for joining us and being a part of our service today. I just want to encourage you on your journey with the Lord, and I want to take some time right now and pray for you. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for every single person that's watching. God, I pray a blessing over them. I thank you for your presence in and through their lives. And I, God, I pray over the word that has been spoken, Lord, that it would not return void and not return empty to them. I pray a blessing upon their week and in everything that they have going on. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have any questions about today's service, please feel free and visit our website at famfm.com. We also have an app, so feel free and download that as well and visit our social media pages for more updates on what's going on here at First Assembly. Again, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great to be with you. God bless you and have a wonderful week.